Hello, 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 and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the attendee for the attendees um, of the Viral Life uh, Project um, seminar. Um, thank you for attending the series of the webinars for the Viral Viral Life Project Symposium, um, which is towards an integrated viral management. My name is Nimal Abu Samha. I'm an early career researcher in the Viral in the Viral Life Project. I will conduct my PhD thesis in how wildfires spread in the wild interfaces. Today, I will be moderating the webinar with Professor Galemo, who is a, who is a co-violating co of the webinar. And it's said behind each great webinar, there's a great co-pilot. Uh, this is the fourth series of the webinars, and it will be one of the main uh, cores and recent methodology in wildfires and fire management. Today, we have two great speakers, uh, Alexander Held, who is a senior expert at European Forest Institute, EFI, and Professor Paolo Fernando at the University of Tras Os Montes and Altidoro in Portugal. The webinar will discuss one of the main cores behind the BioLife project and one of the main aims, which is the fires in the temperate regions and how to transfer the wildfires management knowledge from the south of the European, with the south of the old European continent to the north of the old European continent, the temperate region. Alexander will discuss the recent fires in the temperate regions and how such fires are taking places, how, how, sorry, how such fires are taking places in you uh, and, and are getting managed and the importance of the international experience exchange and why adaptation to a new risk is still slow. Then followed up by Paolo, who will talk about the current large fire problem in the Mediterranean Europe. Paolo will try to illustrate how extreme fire activity relates and it's driven by the land use and landscape changes, fire management policies and fire weather. We will try to have a webinar of 30 minutes for each speaker, followed by Q, by Q and I session uh, please write your uh, questions in the QI box and we will try to answer the most general and as much as time let us do. Uh, thank you, Guillermo and Alexander, for the great uh, debate. This is a great uh, discussion. Uh, now we will move to Paolo. Uh, please, Paolo, have the mic. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I will share my screen. Do you see it? Okay, so <clears throat> I came from, I, I am a, first of all, I am a professor and researcher of wildland fire at the University of Trazos Montes and Alto Douro in Portugal. Um, I, I also belong to the Biolife Consortium and so my perspective, as you will see, or my reality, um, it's, it's on, the, on the other side uh, compared with what Alex has just told us. So, our, so we live with fire, but mostly we live with uh, the worst kind of fire. So we, we live with extreme wildfires, uh, which apparently are becoming uh, uh, an increasingly uh, difficult problem in uh, in southern Europe. Uh, so I, I will start my talk by discussing a bit what an extreme wildfire is because well there are different opinions, different definitions. Then I will try to give an historical perspective um, what has happened to, um, to have these very large and very extreme fires that we have nowadays. And then I will try to quickly uh, describe extreme fires in Southern Europe. So the influences behind them, characteristics or major characteristics and some, uh, a few examples. And then I will conclude with, a, well, with a modest short conclusion. So first of all, an extreme wildfire. Um, it depends on uh, individuals, how, how I mentioned before, but usually it's uh, a wildfire that by one characteristic or another, it's distinctive from let's say the common or regular wildfire. Uh, and it can be due to size, and we often use the term megafire. 
or it can be because of its behavior, so its physical and heat release characteristics, or the impacts it has. Um, sometimes people use statistical thresholds like percentiles uh, to define uh, when a fire um, happens to be an extreme fire. Uh, it's interesting, of course, but uh, this is dependent on the context. So, as, as Alex mentioned, uh, in Germany, a 10 hectare fire can be an extreme fire. But in Portugal, a 10 hectare fire, it's just a normal fire that you start having uh, in, even in winter, whenever conditions are, um, conditions facilitate fire spread. And, it, and this issue of using or adopting statistical thresholds, uh, physically, mostly it has no meaning. So we can say it's arbitrary. Uh, then there are the, the concepts of extreme fire behavior. Again, here there's, there are differences among people. Traditionally, an extreme fire is a fire that cannot be controlled or suppressed by direct methods. So by machinery or by water or by hand tools acting on the fire front. And so people also define fire behavior thresholds that define when a wildfire is extreme. And these thresholds are mostly uh, based on uh, fire intensity or sometimes fire spread rate. More recently, people address this issue by selecting a particular type of extreme fire behavior. So when the fires do not display steady fire spread. So they can display rapid changes, rapid increases in, in uh, rate of spread, for example. That can be unexpected or can be understood as unexpected if an, even if they aren't. Uh, and so some people use this particular definition of extreme fire behavior. And finally, for other people, um, an extreme fire, it's one that has catastrophic impacts uh, and can be called also a disaster fire. So it has these impacts in people, in buildings, infrastructure, and especially when people die in these fires, such as those that recently occurred in Greece and in Portugal. This is just an example of um, a classification of extreme fire. In this case, it's called um, an extreme wildfire event in this publication. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it follows a traditional way. So here you, you see four classes uh, from slow, from uh, low fire intensity to extreme fire intensity, which have been defined long ago. And they are called normal fires because even if they are extreme, they are still more or less expected or more easy to predict. And then extreme wildfire events with three different classes. And these fires exhibit increasingly uh, chaotic behavior, let's say so. And they are more three-dimensional, plume-driven, and so on, like I, I will address uh, in a few minutes. Um, Something uh, which is important to remind, extreme wildfires are not new, even if they appear to be. Uh, so in particular, this wildfire in France in 1949, a very large wild, wildfire, uh, there's a description that it burned or there's an estimate that it burned 6,000 hectares in just 20 minutes after a change in wind direction, and 82 people died on this fire. This, this fire is significant also because this fire did not happen in Mediterranean Europe. So this is in, the, in uh, France, in southern France, but under a climate, under a temperate oceanic climate. 
So this fire reminds us, reminds us that uh, fires of this type, especially with climate change, can uh, easily occur elsewhere in Europe, like, for example, in Germany. Um, this other fire, a relatively small fire with high impact as it killed 22 people. This is a fire from 1979 in Spain, but it's somehow um, like uh, a precursor of of a current current days um, wildland urban interfaces. So it's similar and it happened long before uh, this, this discussion about fire risk at, uh, at the interface between forests and people or urban uh, locations um, existed. So how did we get there? Um, this issue of increasingly larger, increasingly more extreme fires um, with higher uh, burned areas per year in the Mediterranean countries started to be apparent, let's say, late 1960s, early 1970s, depending on country. Formerly, our landscapes was, were a bit like this. Here you see uh, in, Port in central Portugal, all these is farmed, so uh, cultivated. Um, other locations were not cultivated, they were mostly bare, so no forest, uh, maybe some shrubland um, with low biomass or grassland. So these were our landscapes in, in the, in the, by the mid of uh, last century. Um, but, and, and now in these photos, you see the same places nowadays. So here you see that farm, farmland was replaced by shrubland and by pine forests. Here you see uh, the same, the remainings of the same building. And here you see that all these bare land is now fully covered with woodland and shrubland and forest. This is in the border between Portugal and Spain in, in, uh, in central Portugal. And so with this uh, increase in biomass, here you see the same area um, and you see the burned areas in the last decades. Uh, this area has not been much affected, but then you can see it here and you see the surrounding areas and look at all these patches of burned areas and uh, overlapped burned areas that happened since 1975. So this was mostly a process of declined use of biomass by people and by uh, animals, by, by uh, cattle, and goats and so on. Uh, so this here you see for Northern Portugal, uh, but this can be generalized at least in, in Portugal. So decrease in full, full wood consumption by people, decreased in biomass consumed by animals and de decrease in shrubs that were harvested by people and, and taken uh, and, and, and the final end of this biomass was to fertilize um, agricultural fields. And for each hectare of agriculture, they need to harvest about 12 hectares of shrubs. Um, but um, by the 1940s, and this process was generalized in Southern Europe, pine forestation in large scale, and so this decrease in biomass consumption combined with the forestation to increase full hazard as you see in this graph. And then afterwards it starts burning and so full hazard starts decreasing because uh, wildfire replaced human activity. Um, and also these processes enabled a change in the fire regime so what you see here is the fire weather index. It's a percentile for extreme fire weather conditions, burned area. Um, and so we can say that before um, 
our system was full limited because full accumulation was not enough to drive this type of fire activity. And nowadays is weather driven. So you no longer have a limitation in fuel. And so your fuel hazard increased and all depends uh, of weather. And so now we have these types of fires initially in pine forests uh, and afterwards in other vegetation types. Um, we also have some combined effects of fire management policies because starting in the 1970s, all Mediterranean countries enforced very strict policies based on ignition control and in extinguishing all fires. And these gave results in general. So uh, a 66% decrease in burned area in this period, in this 27 year period, of course is variable. And so you look at the map and you see areas where it decreased a lot in green and in purple areas where it increased. Uh, but in general, for the whole Mediterranean basin, it decreased. Um, and some people wonder, is this effective? Can we maintain these results? So there's this interesting study from southern France. And so they examine the number of fires go, went down, burned area um, even more. But then they look what happened in terms of weather. So presumably because of climate change, fire danger or the meteorological component, component of fire danger in, is now more severe. Fools are more abundant, as you see in this second graph. Um, and human pressure index, it's higher. And this is mostly related with the wildland urban interface and tourism. And so when fire activity goes down, it means you have more fuel because wildfires consumed fuel and uh, stopped doing so. Uh, and if you combine these with higher fire risk from weather and from human pressure and from fuel, you get conditions that will favor uh, more extreme fires. And so it's more or less the situation we are nowadays. Um, I took this data from this global fire database, which starts in 2003. Uh, and I selected just the largest fires, those that we can call mega fires. Uh, although we could perfectly use a lower threshold, for example, 5,000 hectares. And so you see for Southern Europe, uh, they can happen everywhere. Um, and also, these, these database is not complete because not, not all these fires were recorded by, this relies on remote sensing and some fires are missing. Um, anyway, you will see that um, most of these fires are concentrated in the western part of the, of the Mediterranean basin, so in Portugal and parts of Spain. And why is that? Uh, Probably because of the climate, which is still Mediterranean, but it's humid. And so net primary productivity is still high, as you can see here. So we can grow trees like in Germany. Um, but at the same time, we have the fire danger or the fire weather that gives us a plenty of number of days with extreme conditions. As you see, it's not the same as in Turkey or in central Spain, but we, we still can have those extreme days every year. Um, and so when you combine these two conditions and you have ignition sources and you have favorable terrain and our landscape is quite, um, it's, um, these fires usually not always, but usually happen in mountains but not too steep mountains because uh, when you have steeper terrain, it can also break fire spread. So this is the, the perfect combination for these types of fires. So our climate is good at growing biomass, then it's 
good at drying it, so making it, it, making it into fuel and then burn it under extreme weather conditions. Um, there might be other factors or people usually think that other fi factors are involved and this issue of afforestation, first with pines, then with eucalypts, it's uh, very debated. Um, and so after our fires in 2017, it, it was easy to find these in the news, uh, directly um, blaming eucalypt plantations for our fires and the people that died in those fires. So we decided to take a look and in, fa in fact, the, our data or the existing data does not really support these because you see this huge effort in a, a forestation, uh, three times more area planted with eucalypts. Here you see the burned area in red and in blue you see the eucalypt burned areas. So eucalypts in the end are a minor fraction of what burns and when you try to explain the factors behind area burns, uh, trying to uh, attribute some guilt, let's say so, to eucalypts, you don't really find a trend and it's not statistically relevant. And likewise, we found out that fire size is independent of forest composition and you can have, in fact, the largest fires occur when eucalypt representation in the landscape is lower. Um, and also fuels vary much more within forest types than between forest types. And in many plantation forests, there's a, ne a negative feedback. I mean, the fact that they are intensively managed decreases full, full accumulation because they are short rotation plantations. And finally, uh, and one of the authors of these rule of thumb is watching this session, Marty Alexander. So there's not under extreme conditions of strong winds and uh, dry fuels, very dry fuels, there's not really a difference between vegetation types, at least at flammable, between flammable vegetation types like conifer forest or eucalypt forests or shrublands uh, in terms of fire behavior. Um, of course, uh, all this doesn't mean we should not be concerned. Um, I'm particularly concerned because of this situation. So after these fires, you get all this regeneration, which is not managed. It's not even harvested. It's not uh, coppiced, so it's abandoned. These, this is just two and a half years after the wildfire in central Portugal. So you see all these dead fuels standing, dead trees or on the forest floor. You see all these re-sprouting along the stem of the eucalypts and this is about five meters tall. We see regeneration not, not just from sprouting, also from seedlings. You see invasive species, acacia here, that can uh, increase the flammability of the system. Um, and so there might be actually a positive feedback because of all these plantations abandoned that can increase area burn in the future or more severe fire in the future. Uh, of course, we don't really know how this compares with the full dynamics in our native vegetation uh, under the same circumstances. So after large fires and when abandoned. Um, of course, extreme wildfires are allowed or are enabled by extreme fire weather. And that's what we see here. For the largest fires in Portugal, you see the cumulative distribution of burned area or the fraction of burned area. So here you see the weather, the atmospheric component, wind and, and, um, and relative humidity and so on, the effects on full moisture. Here you see drought and here you see atmospheric instability and you notice that all happens uh, when these indexes increase. In the, on this side, it's percentiles. Um, and this um, enables us to try some type of clustering of classification of these fires as a function of weather conditions, fire weather. 
But then we noticed that fuels are also important. And so we see that these fires uh, burn essentially old fuels. So areas that did not burn during the last 14 years and where the full load is at there near the maximum potential for that landscape. And in fact, uh, this was noticed elsewhere, for example, in Greece, and they called of a synergy between full and weather. So when weather and drought combines with favorable fuels, you get these types of fires. But in the end, fires are made by the landscape. So fires are mostly controlled, at least in size, by variation in continuity. So forest or shrubland continuity in the landscape and pyrodiversity, which basically is the, um, the mosaic of fuel ages and time since fire and fire recurrence from pests, from, uh, from um, uh, past fires. Uh, we have some scarcity of data about extreme fire behavior in Europe, so we don't have many detailed and based on field data reconstructions of fire spread. Here you see uh, fires that were reconstructed in Europe. Uh, very often the motive they are reconstructed, so they are studied, it's because there were human fatalities and you can see those in red. But in total, in this database, we have only about 100 fires for which we know some kind of uh, fire behavior characteristic. And so typical values or extreme values for these re reconstructed fires in Southern Europe, rates of spread about five kilometers per hour, with which depending on full load, we can be about 50,000 kilowatts per meter of fire line intensity. Hot weather, uh, dry air, and very low full moisture content, and of course, uh, strong wind speeds. Um, these very large fires above 10,000 hectares, they tend to last for a number of days, although the relationship is not that good. Um, more importantly, these large fires are associated with um, with uh, fast growing fires, both in terms of area per unit time and in terms of speed or rate of spread. If you look here, you, you have two outliers, but if you remove these two points, you get a pretty good explanation of variation in fire size as a function of the rate of expansion in the landscape. And so these large fires are typically also if they are if they spread faster they also have more they are more intense because fire intensity is proportional to rate of spread some typical fires now um, so in this database these these were the faster spreading fires in southern europe in portugal 2003 extreme fire danger very high atmospheric instability, dry lightning, and multiple ignitions. Here you can see the day with the most important spread. It's covered by clouds and smoke, and in the next day. So the, these, of course, this, this was caused by uh, several ignitions, but in 25 days, about 100,000 hectares burned in this event. Another characteristic is synchronicity. Uh, this, so fires are simultaneous, these large fires, both in the same region or in the same country, or even in, the, in different countries. So I give you this example. Same vegetation type, cork oak woodlands, same day, under extreme fire weather conditions. And you get these similar fires in Portugal and in Spain. So. You see the shape of the fire, winds coming from the same direction, and, uh, and the distance between these is maybe 150 kilometers. Um, other relevant fires, these fires in Greece at the time in 2007, they were 
very important. They were, they were a tragedy because of the number of fatalities, as you see here. And these fires were extremely large. Um, and more recently, also in Greece, we had also this tragedy in 2018 in Maki. So this fire, and relative a fast fire, but not under particularly severe weather conditions, but it happened that the fire just ran into the city and people were trapped between the fire and the sea and uh, with burned vehicles and so on. And so all these people died. So this is a real concern for the future because events like these uh, in wildland urban interfaces can happen much more in the future. And finally, in Portugal, 2017, these plume-driven fires, uh, like we can call it three-dimensional fires. So these fires did not happen before, at least they are not documented. And they happened in June, the Pedrogão Grand fire after heat waves and the very dry uh, winter and autumn. Th again, with thunderstorms and dry lightning, the atmosphere was quite, quite favorable for this type of fire development. Um, and, ex and fire danger was very high to extreme in the region. And then in October, uh, these repeated only in a different way. So fuels were critically dry because uh, the entire summer did not rain. There was this influence of this approaching hurricane, Ophelia which brought strong winds and warm and dry air from Northern Africa, highly unstable atmosphere, although not as high as in Pedrogão. Um, and the fire danger was even, or was much higher. And in, here you see values for the different Canadian codes uh, for different weather stations in Portugal. And you will notice that we have new record breaking values on many stations recorded uh, values above the 90th, the 95, the 99th percentile for the various indexes, codes of the system. Here you can see how fire growth rates of two of these fires, Padrogão and then Sertan in October. You will see this spike here in the, in the Padrogão fire. So these fires were characterized by these uh, strong interactions between the fire and the atmosphere. And this was mostly, this happened mostly because fire growth was very fast due to the conditions and because there was a shift in wind direction, which is very common in disaster fires elsewhere in the world these very fast and strong release of energy combined with a highly unstable atmosphere. And so we had this spiroconvection phenomenon and the plume developed to 13 kilometers of height. And then you have this phenomena of condensation, formation of ice, lightning, and then what is called as known as a firestorm or with a blow up. Um, with downdrafts, so very strong winds that hit the ground and the plume of the fire collapses. And so um, it, it was uh, recorded here by satellite and here by a commercial uh, flight. Um, and so you see that this event, this blow up or this plume collapse um, coincides exactly with the this fire growth maximum peak of the fire growth, which was about 4,500 hectares in an hour. And so people were killed uh, during this event. The same in October, only differently because it happened that night. Um, and, but it was recorded, for example, by this wind farm. Uh, this was the passage of the, of the Ophelia hurricane strong winds, but then these winds subsided and at around midnight you see again winds, around, again no, you see for the first time winds of about 100 kilometers per hour. So this is 
uh, this reveals the downbursts or the downdraft and the, the collapse of the plume. And again, most people in these fires died uh, around uh, these two, three hours. Um, and so here you see the Pedrogion Grand Fire. This is the location of the where dead people were found. It follows an arch, so it follows the the shape of the plume of the fire. And this is the October uh, fires, even larger, as you see, wind driven. But then at night, with this interaction between fires and plume collapse, you see this uh, dispersion of places where people die. And so 66 people died here and 51 in the other fires. So um, a, a small conclusion, uh, because I don't have time to uh, elaborate on these, but mostly um, our challenge in Europe, as I see it in brief words, is to live with fire in this flammable landscape and under a changing climate and living in safety and these of course entails all kinds of measures even related with wildland and the urban interfaces design and uh, construction standards and so on uh, but at the same time trying to benefit from fire related ecosystem services uh, of course most people in southern europe don't appreciate these alex complained about this in relation to Germany. It's not really that different in Southern Europe. Probably the difference is that among scientists and academics and technicians, we are in a different stage of acceptance. We know that some fires, not all, not all fires are the same and some fires are, have benefits. Um, and at the same time, trying to balance these with the minimization of fire-related ecosystem nice services. So the opposed uh, to ecosystem services. So all the nuisances and problems that extreme uh, wildfires bring. So this involves several different things, but certainly involves using planned fire on a much larger scale. And even more important than these, because we will never be able to use plant fire at the scale that is required. We know this from Australia or from the United States. So we should also use unplanned fire. So some fires uh, in certain landscapes, in certain ecosystems, under certain conditions should be allowed to burn freely. Uh, unless they threaten some values or some human assets or, for example, forest plantations or some places that should not burn in uh, any circumstance. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo, for the great webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will give the the, the mic to uh, to Guillermo for um, we will extend the webinar until five thirty five, and then we can um, we can end the webinar. So we'll have like almost um, like almost ten minutes of questions. Please, okay. Guillermo. Thank you. So, pa Paolo, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, tremendously useful and 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 good. Um, we have a few questions. One is from from Lazarus uh, Philippides. He's asking if, if it is advisable or worth to reforest areas um, by slowly replacing pine trees with less flammable species. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose so. Uh, we don't really have the experience. Well, I mean, we don't really have the, the much evidence about the results in terms of making these landscapes less fire prone. But I see it much as a scale issue because, and, and from what I know in Portugal, um, it's very difficult to do under the current framework of people abandoning the landscape, uh, public ad administration or forest services or nature conservation services. 
we see these in Portugal, but we see these in other Southern European countries. Those organizations have less and less resources. So they, they, it's difficult for them to engage in these type of large scale of operations, in this case, changing forest composition. Uh, private owners also uh, have difficulties in doing so because they don't have the resources or they just don't live there anymore. So, of course, in some circumstances, this can happen naturally. We see that happening in some regions uh, in Portugal or in Spain, the, the, the places I know, or maybe in Italy. So we see it. We see repl gradual replacement of uh, pine forests by the Sidwo's oak forests. And I suppose that that will bring some benefits in terms of decreasing extreme fire likelihood. But as I said, we don't really have data about that. Excellent. Uh, the next question is by Andy Elliott in the UK. He says, um, um, in the context of changing land use and changing climate, um, is managing fuel continuity the key to reach a safe new normal in Europe? Um, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it's very important, of course, but it's also difficult um, given all the constraints we have and, and uh, and this is valid both in Central Europe, as Alex explained very well, but it's also valid in Southern Europe. So we try, and uh, currently in Portugal, there's a, let's say, a strong movement in favor of that, reducing fuels by any means possible. Uh, but, it's, but it's a long-term effort, it's expensive. And that's why I gave, in the conclusion, I gave some emphasis to the need of uh, uh, having the ability or the capability to uh, be able to deal better with fires in the landscape, those fires that occur outside the summer or out, uh, under uh, non-extreme conditions, because those fires are the ones that will can make a difference in terms of assisting the suppression of uh, fires under extreme conditions. So, but this is difficult also to be accepted by society, especially in a landscape where we, even if we have much less people than in the past, very often people are uh, scattered all over the landscape. So, um, it's easy to explain these concepts and ideas in ideal terms and in, as a philosophy, living with fire and managing fuels at landscape scales. But I know that the reality, it's difficult. So it's complicated and we, it will always be complicated. Thank you. Um, the last question, because there, there will be a, a short presentation after this. Uh, the last, yeah, there are more questions, Paulo, uh, but that, those can be answered later on, on written. Um, it's coming from Portugal, this question is El Mano Silva. It says, uh, great presentation, Paulo, we agree. And he says, do you think that the north of Europe uh, needs urgently to look uh, at the south of Europe to learn and prepare for fires, especially of the mega fire type? And should the north of Europe be more prepared for wild urban interface fires? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, in terms of fire suppression capabilities, uh, and again, as Alex explained, the firefighters in Central Europe and Northern Europe are more used to uh, structural fires, so they don't really have the experience of dealing with forest fires. Uh, so I, I suppose they can learn a lot with the experience of Southern countries, and this is always happening. There have been exchanges, uh, especially in the frame of uh, prescribed fire training. There have been common um, exercises in Portugal, in, uh, in the UK, in Germany also, I think, in Spain. So these exchanges are going on, but they need to be upscaled. And so I, I believe that Northern Europe uh, fire suppression organizations can benefit from our long experience 
even if our ex even when our experience is not that good but uh, at least um, fire management agencies in southern europe um, have these decades experience with all kinds of fires so i i, I i'm sure they can uh, give some assistance in uh, in uh, disseminating experience and, and knowledge thank thank you paulo um i i pass it back to to the chair um that has is presenting some other people thank you so much paulo thank you so much guillermo and paulo um it was really great uh, discussion and now we will have uh, now we will have like uh, two minutes each for the uh, ecrs uh, Bethany and um, Kathleen, I'll share um, a short presentation. So we'll start with Bethany, who will introduce herself and uh, what's her role in the BioRevive project. Bethany, please. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bethany Hanna. I am one of the PhD candidates with PyroLife, and I will um, I'll be just giving a quick introduction. We will be um, giving introductions uh, as PhD candidates or as we call ourselves early stage researchers in the coming weeks. So you'll hear from um, each of the 15 um, PhDs um, moving forward. Uh, so uh, I am currently based in California, but I will be uh, studying at Open University in Catalonia in Spain uh, once um, travel restrictions are lifted. Um, my research topic is engaging communities at risk. So I'm coming in from the social science side of, um, of research. And um, I have been involved in the wildland fire industry for more than 20 years. I have a master's of environmental studies uh, with a focus on wildland fire management and communications. But I started in fire as what's called a hotshot. Hotshot crews in the US are specialized crews that travel all over the country. Um, fighting fire and uh, doing fuels manage work and management work and forestry related work as well. Uh, so I spent a better part of a decade um, fighting fire with the US Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management as a hotshot. And what that did was um, expose me to fire in all sorts of ecosystems and uh, conditions and fuel types uh, from Florida to Alaska from um, the high desert in Utah to the big timber in California. And what that experience led me to understand is that fire is as much a social issue as it is an environmental or emergency management issue. Um, and that uh, led me to want to understand our human relationship with fire. Um, as we all know, moving into a new uh, future in, in fire environments, uh, we're gonna need public support and, and buy-in. Um, if we're going to be successful with integrated fire management. And so I'm really excited to be looking at engaging communities. That's going to be a really critical part moving forward. I would uh, really encourage anyone who has experience with engaging communities at risk or ideas around it to uh, reach out. Um, I would love to connect with people. My information is uh, shown here, but we also have um, all of the PhD candidates have profiles on the PyroLife website. So at any point in time, if you are interested in reaching out, I know that we are all eager to connect with the fire minds throughout the world. So please, uh, please visit the website. Also with that, um, the presentations, uh, the webinars that we've been um, showing over the last couple of weeks and moving forward are all posted on the website as well. And I will just close up um, with saying that I also run a small nonprofit in the US called the American Wildfire Experience. And one of the biggest projects that we have is called the Smoky Generation, which is a wildland fire oral history and digital storytelling project. And um, it has a collection of oral histories and stories uh, from wildland firefighters representing every decade from the 1940s to present. So great, rich, um, a very entertaining uh, collection of, of, of fun stories around wildland fire. So I encourage you to visit those websites if you're interested. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity and I will pass it along to Kathleen. Hello everyone. Thank you, Bethany. I, I love hearing your story. I've heard it many times, but every time there's, it's just still enjoyable and so, so rich. 
Um, I am uh, another early stage researcher with the Pyro Life Project. And I mean, if you wouldn't mind, maybe you can scroll down and there you go, awesome. <laughs> uh, I am a, a French and US citizen. I'm from mainly from California as well, and uh, currently based in Catalonia, in Spain. And my project will be um, involving stakeholders through transdisciplinary cross-risk fire research, which is quite a mouthful, um, but I'll get into that in a, in a minute. I'm working mainly with the Paucosa Foundation in, in Catalonia, but with uh, some secondments as well in uh, Wageningen University and with the Scion Research Group in New Zealand, which are all just amazing opportunities and, and perspectives to, to integrate. Um, my background more as, you know, in my academic and activist and applied background is more in uh, agroecology and studying sustainable food systems development, uh, which is quite transdisciplinary in nature, um, especially in the face of climate change as farmers um, and indigenous people face these new uh, realities and adapt. Um, my, I studied at UC Berkeley and got a master's degree in agroecology in the International University of Andalusia. And um, through that background, I really learned that it's essential to center participatory research and listen very closely to local knowledges and especially indigenous knowledges. Um, so with all of that background in mind, um, this project I'll be working on is um, the transdisciplinary aspect of it will be integrating how uh, what lessons we can learn from water management, um, like several of our speakers um, alluded to last week, um, into uh, you know integrating water management into resilient fire management. I'll also be engaging directly with uh, communities and stakeholders as much as possible through participatory research. And uh, I'll also be another aspect is exploring how digital tools can uh, contribute to, to all of this, um, to creating more resilient social ecological systems through, um, you know, storytelling or risk management or uh, just creating open source data with, with all kinds of different initiatives. And it's so exciting to learn more every week uh, from every speaker, from the ESRs, and um, as Alex was saying earlier, I'm, I'm lo really looking forward to creating this network and, and more friends as we all, as we all uh, you know, adapt towards, a, towards the future together and transform what we're learning into action. So thank you so much. Namir, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Bethany and uh, Kathleen, for uh, for your um, for introducing yourselves. Um, well, thank you, Alexander and uh, Paolo, for the great uh, sessions. Uh, thank you, Guillermo, for um, uh, what's called handling the questions and uh, answering them and coordinating them very brilliantly. Thank you so much. Um, and also, um, as as an ECR, I'm also looking forward for a very um, collaborative, resilient, and uh, innovative way of. Uh, learning about wildfires and um, um, towards an integrated fire management. Um, very, very interested into the BioLife Network Plus that would be established from, uh, that we are actually establishing and is established within the program. Um, sorry. And um, well, thank you so much for attending the webinar and uh, we will post the video on the, on the BioLife um, uh, website along with the blog. And looking forward for meeting you next webinar. Thank you so much and have a good day.